So good morning, everyone. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for being part of this first webinar on the overall rollout of the protection analysis update guidance uh, that uh, the ICE Global Protection Cluster we developed together with some operations. My name is uh, Francesco Michele. I'm the Strategic and Analysis Advocacy Officer in the Global Protection Cluster, and I've been supporting the Global Protection Cluster on the protection analysis update and previously in the development of the protection analytical framework. Um, we are a small group, so I have a presentation ready. Um, as you can see, we'll be divided in two parts. Uh, but uh, my colleague team uh, is uh, is going to have a look to the chat, so please stop me at any time. The goal of today is actually to have a guide through uh, what the new guidance uh, include, uh, because we try to make an effort to simplify the process, to make it more focused and so on. So I have the tendency to speak uh, faster, so if there is anything that you might not understand while I'm presenting, please stop me or write in chat or raise your hand and we will address it. Uh, as you can see, it's in English. We are almost English speaker, I, if I understand, but I try to include some French subtitles and I also can address a uh, question both in French and in Spanish if there is a need. Mm, so today, uh, this is the first of three webinars that we are going to plan. This is about the guidance itself, uh, what it includes, and uh, it's going to be divided in two parts. The first one, uh, looking at the basics uh, for 2023, so what we expect within protection clusters in terms of protection analysis updates and a bit the process, uh, also including the support provided by the global protection cluster. Uh, we are going to then have a pause for question and answer if there are no question and answer coming during the presentation. And then in the second part, um, what I wanted to try to do with all of you is to look at the protection analysis update format, go chapter by chapter and provide you more, as, more or less a sense of what we expect to have in each chapter so we can actually have an open discussion um, according to what do, how do you see it and how it can be rolled out. Um, so, as said, uh, please stop me at any time if you have questions or write them in chat, but we are going to have anyway plenty of time for reflection uh, after the two presentations, and I will try not to be uh, too quick uh, in presenting. Uh, is there any question, doubt or clarification you need before we start? Uh, maybe some thumbs up, otherwise we can deep, deep into it. So let me start. Um, I will start from the basics. Um, well, the first uh, the first element is about the objective of the protection analysis updates. Um, we we shared uh, the standard operating procedure where we also outline the objective of the protection analysis updates. Uh, but we try to a bit more learn from the last year and a half as for everything and clarifying a bit better what do we expect with the protection analysis update. Uh, I would say that there are three core objectives. One is to use the protection analysis update, update to call the attention on protection risks specifically, but also to uh, call the attention by, by providing concrete recommendations at every level. So we are able to engage the humanitarian coordinator and the general humanitarian country team and other actors in pushing forward for specific recommendations to address protection risks. The second goal is related to Broadly, let's call it advocacy, but the idea is that the protection analysis update should be that document uh, that is used at cluster level to basically showcase better the voices also of lo our local partners, local colleagues and communities, which uh, uh, which not readily we put in documents, but it's not easy to provide a qualitative analysis that shows very well what's happening on the ground. So the PAU should give also us this opportunity. And of course, the protection analysis updates is, as we will see afterwards during the presentation, it's sort of the core document to plan around the specific efforts, both at cluster level, but at the global protection cluster. And then generally speaking, the idea of the protection analysis update is that they become the core documents at the level of the country to inform general work of the cluster and the partners in terms of humanitarian planning, programming priorities and protection of response. Of course, there are many other analysis documents that we develop, but the idea is that giving an account of protection risks, uh, they become sort of the uh, authoritative document and analysis in the country. So, uh, 
for the ones of you that knew the professionalized update so far, we've been working on those. We introduced um, several changes. The first is about the formats and the frequency. Um, when it comes to the format, we have been simplifying the formats and we will see later. But the idea is now that uh, we have two possibilities or we try to have uh, two possibilities at the level of the operations. One is to have a format that allows for a sector wide analysis. So something that is authoritative at national level and provide the account and the update on protection risk findings, messages and recommendation. But then we realize through the experience of operation that there sometimes there is a need for partner and colleagues uh, to have a quick analysis, something that can be developed in an onset emergency or in specific situation or to focus deeper on a specific thematic or on a specific geographic area. So we also develop a brief protectionized update that, as you will see, it's very short. And the idea is that both the standard and the brief PAU can work, you know, more or less together in one uh, in sort of during the year to actually keep the attention uh, on, on protection risks uh, and they can be used very flexibly. Uh, the frequency, there is no any more uh, sort of quarterly frequency as uh, the previous instruction, but the idea is that the protection cluster coordinators uh, with the partners, the SAG and uh, the EORs can actually plan out um, uh, what is the best timing to actually to have a protection analysis update. We would advise, for instance, to have one before the HNO and the HRPs, but that uh, really depends on countries. You might have something happening a mid-year, so that I don't know the revision of the strategy of the humanitarian coordinator on other moments, whereby it would be important to, yeah, to have an analysis beforehand. So that's the reason that we thought that at the level of the cluster, one of the decisions and one of the things that will be interesting to do is to map strategic moment whereby having protection analysis updates. Uh, there is a minimum that we expect from clusters, so we can maintain sort of a consistency, which is providing at least two standards PAU, so two more broad country-wise uh, protection analysis update, and one brief that can be of any kind, and it can be discussed with partners, SAG, uh, and AUR. Um, one of the things that we've been asking our colleagues, uh, regional focal point in the, in the global protection cluster together with the operation, is to actually try this month to plan uh, more or less the protection analysis update expected during the year. This is extremely important because it will, uh, will allow us first to anticipate certain processes in terms of support, but also, and more specifically, it will help us out in linking and doing much more targeted advocacy on specific moments. So if there are pledging conferences, if there are specific moments at the Security Council or other, other important situation or events for an operation, at the level of the global protection cluster, we can really plan a very much, much stronger advocacy support. Uh, what is new uh, specifically in the protection analysis update compared to the last year and a half is that, of course, um, there are the two formats, but also we introduce page limitations. So the standard is maximum to be 15 pages and the brief six pages. And we realize that this can both be helping in the field to actually rationalize what can go in a document instead of having maybe long document that try to cover everything, but much more focused document. Uh, and also it simplified the, the, the elaboration. And uh, the second major change, uh, um, we have been, uh, I will start from the, 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 I think what is the most important step. In the last four months, we've been working together with the Global Protection AORs. And we developed 15 standard core definition of protection risks. Then now you can find the website and also are part of the guidance. Uh, and the goal is to have those 15 protection risks guiding our um, narrative. So presenting the analysis uh, throughout these 15 protection risks. So we can have a common narrative. And of course, we have to be able to show the contribution of each area to actually the analysis, but at least the presentation is going to be more or less consolidated across operations. Uh, the second major uh, change in the protection analysis update is that we limited, and you, have, you will see there are specific criteria now that we're going to try to use, is to limit the updates to actually visualizing five core priority protection risks for the period code. So we have been having for the last, uh, we've been 
our cluster has been producing around 55 to 56 protection analysis updates in the last year and a half. And uh, sometimes some documents are very long with many risks. And the feedback that we had from uh, donors and other colleagues is that it's really difficult to pinpoint what is actually priority for the period. So the protection analysis update should be less of trying to present everything, but really, really much focus to the period that they cover. Um, for, for instance, now we suggest to have uh, one for the first quarter, and if it's developed for the first quarter, to cover the period January, March, and really focus on what are the priority risks in that period. Then, as you will see, uh, the idea that at the level of the cluster, if, you, if there is a possibility and, and, uh, and the need to develop a longer analysis, a longer document, that can be done. But the protection as update should be actually be that uh, vehicle of the core priority for the period. Then, uh, in terms of the formats, uh, we introduce several elements to try to simplify it because oftentimes I think that our partner and our clusters in the field are very good in doing analysis, but oftentimes it's not easy to represent it in ways that actually it's uh, actually make a, make an impact on the on the on the targets we would like to influence with the analysis or what we want to influence with the analysis. So we introduce certain elements uh, that are core. So we introduce an executive summary, we revise the response section, and we revise the, the recommendation section. We will see that later. But then we also introduce some publishing criteria to simplify the use of the protection analysis updates and have a bit more of consistency across operations. Um, the publishing criteria, as you will see, are just to actually agree that when we publish a document as a protection analysis update, it's consistent. So we all of them, we have all of the analysis consistent. So even the donors and uh, the targets that you would like to reach already know what to expect. Um, but then uh, uh, one of the important elements for 2023 is that as a global protection cluster in general, we are never going to stop a document of analysis. So if in the elaboration of a protection analysis update, uh, eventually, it comes out a document that is longer or it's wider or it would like to have a different focus. We will work together in order to see how to publish it. Probably we are not going to publish as protection as update, but we can publish as any other different type of analysis. So we thought that it will be important to, as a sector, to show both, to have both flexibility because the, the, the needs of different operations are, are quite specific, but also to show, to have a consistency in terms of uh, the way we present protection risk analysis specific. To do that, uh, and that's part of this webinar, we develop uh, several guidance. Uh, in order to develop the guidance, we have been doing two general exercises. One is to look back at all the protection analysis updated published in the last two years. Uh, we actually mapped out best practice, um, certain operation that took that that, that uh, actually shaped them in ways that can be helpful for the for all of the other uh, other operations, and uh, and then also we have been having and engaging with several operations to test them out uh, to see what can what how they can be actually used in operation. So the guidance you're gonna see. is mostly a compiling of best practice rather than a guidance developed by ourselves. So we try our best, but of course the idea of the rollout is also to learn from the rollout itself. So going to the guidance, uh, um, you can find uh, the whole guidance in the website, uh, in specifically in the in uh, in the section of the protection analytical framework, and below you will see the whole guidance for both the protection analysis updates and the protection risks. So the first part is uh, two formats. What we try to do with the formats is not just to provide a format, but actually to develop a sample. So uh, if you are gonna, when you're gonna download the, both the standard and the brief, you are gonna see that they are already an analysis. So we try to develop a full-fledged analysis that can be used as an inspiration, not to actually be identical, but at least we realize that sometimes it's better to have an inspiration to build upon. Then the two documents are, uh, are in Word, they are modifiable, so there is plenty of flexibility to use them and to adapt them uh, with the whatever the visual elements or other elements you want to include in the, in the document itself. Then uh, in order to help with the, the actually the, the, the analysis itself of protection risks, uh, we a second, uh, a second document it, it relates is called the protection risk explanatory note. And you will find inside uh, two specific parts. One is the all 15 definitions 
of mutational risk agreed by the Global Protection Cluster and the AOS. And uh, what we try to do is to make them simple and operational rather than uh, legalistic or technical. And they really focus on uh, more or less giving an idea of what should be monitored to identify protection risk, what type of uh, actions, what type of violation uh, can be included in each protection risk, and more or less some hints on what information and data can support in actually monitoring and analyzing protection risks. And in complementarity to the, the core document of the, the protection risk explanatory note that also give you a bit of a sense on how to adapt the 15 categories to the context, we will see that later, we develop a two-pager uh, that actually builds on the same analysis that you find in the, in the sample formats. Uh, but what we try to do is to, to provide um, the analysis itself, so the narrative analysis, and tag each part of the analysis with the protection analytical framework categories. We realize that our colleagues from the from IM they they are very good in understanding the framework. But sometimes when we when we coordinate with uh, partners, colleagues, uh, or the wider group that might be IM specific, the protection analytical framework might might might, might be felt cumbersome. So this document is it's uh, it's developed this guidance to actually have a visual look of what does it mean structuring an analysis using the logic of the protection analytical framework. And last, uh, um, so the, the package is composed of these four documents. Uh, there is a <clears throat> specific, what we call the protection analysis update annotated template that provide a specific guidance on both uh, uh, the format of the PAU, so to adapt it, to adjust it, and also the core elements, uh, but also some uh, guidance on the content uh, and, uh, and uh, suggestion on uh, information and management elements, graphics, uh, and other aspects or sources that can be used for different sections. So the idea is that the whole package uh, work more or less together, so there is not just a format and try to understand how to fill it up, but it's actually provide a hands-on uh, set of steps that you can actually build up and, uh, and use for the protection analysis update. So these are the basics. Uh, so the basics are the two new formats, uh, the frequency to be decided at country level, uh, and the adaptation to be decided also with partner, AUR, colleagues, and so on, and then uh, much more focus on protection risk and the specific, the 15 uh, standard categories that we developed at the, with, the, with the colleagues of the AUS. Um, I would like now to go on the process, but before I move on to the process, maybe I pause a moment um, to ask you if uh, so far everything is clear, if there is any doubt or question. We are a small group, so please uh, feel free to jump in or give me some thumbs up uh, if everything is okay, and then uh, maybe I can do the second part on the process, and then we can go back to the questions. Fantastic. Okay, there is a uh, Ellen. I saw you raise your hand. I don't know if it was a mistake or. Okay, maybe, well, anyway, we, we will have plenty of time later. Okay, thank you. So let's go to the process. Uh, we realized that um, to ensure consistency uh, and to simplify better the, and the support that even the Global Protection Cluster can provide, but also to support our cluster coordinator and co-coordinator in engage multiple partners, we wanted to actually more or less structure the process, but not uh, making it too cumbersome. Uh, and the idea is that from the start the idea of the protection analysis update to the elaboration, I mean, whatever time is needed for the coordination in the, in, uh, in, uh, in the operation, at least the support from the GPC doesn't take more than three, four days if, if we work a bit on anticipation. So let's look a bit at the general steps. So I will, I will give you an overview of the core general step. But then I will show also what you will find in the standard operating procedure that actually basically uh, is a summary of the core steps. So the first element is that the protection analysis update, the decision to, to elaborate a protection analysis update, uh, the identification and so on, is, uh, is at the level of the cluster in country. So cluster coordinator and co-coordinator in consultation with the AOR coordinators, the SAG if it's established, the partner and so on. So the protection analysis update becomes should be a consultative process with uh, with all the constituency within the cluster in the operation. 
What we found in the past and what will be very helpful is, is that if every operation can map out the production of data expected to 2023, and then uh, in doing so, uh, maintain a strong relation with the regional focal point at the level of the global protection cluster. So if uh, in your operation, can, you can reach out to, your, to the regional focal point and actually discuss together when you plan to have protection analysis updates, that you will that will really help us out in uh, in uh, be strategic all together, not, not just in the, in the in its elaboration, but also in its use and make sure that with the ultimate goal of the protection analysis update, which is using it, is actually much more effective. The full process, when the process starts, so the consultation, the look at the, at the data and information, the shaping and the analysis, then the elaboration of the documents, so on and so forth, uh, all of that, the lead and the supervision uh, stays within the protection cluster. So that's the, the global protection cluster is all just there to give support. Um, so the all timing and the monitors and so on can be actually discussed with the uh, uh, coordinating the clusters. It's important to know is that in uh, one step that we introduce is that when the professionalism update is free for core criteria afterwards, in order to publish them, you know, to, to do basically what we introduced, what I was explaining before. So either publishing the PA date or publishing and um, so the region. Focal point should be Francesco. strongly involved. It would be good to involve them during all the sure, and they can guide you in, uh, in shaping the document. And, 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 and yeah, you lost me. Hello? Yes, you're lagging in yeah? sound. And maybe you can turn off your camera in the meantime. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but still, I mean, there's can, like... Can, can you hear me now? Hello? That's yes, you. we can. I mean, That's we can. I can hear you. But still, like... Yes, we can problem. hear, but the connection is not very fluid. Okay, what about now? Sorry, my the internet here sometimes falls down. Is it better? Hello? Yes. yes. Better. Thank you. Sorry for that. Sometimes the internet falls down here in Tunisia. Sorry for that. Um, I don't know where you lost me, but uh, I think that we were discussing, you lost me when we were speaking about involving the regional focal point for uh, ensuring that uh, the quality criteria and all the support that is provided by the clusters. Um, at the last step, as a general step, uh, um, in the global protection cluster, for the one you don't know, we have an uh, advocacy pillar. So me and two colleagues, Marie and Elisa, are in charge of the advocacy. So in our, what we are going to do on our side is just to look at three, four core criteria to ensure a bit of consistency and starting looking together. So that's the moment in where we engage our operations to actually look at core dissemination strategy. We've been realizing that sometimes with the protection analysis update, if we are if we have better conversation on how we want to disseminate, we actually have a wider impact. And in many cases, uh, and I had, we had that question all along last year, in sensitive context, uh, you might, there might be you know, sensitiveness in publishing the documents, so we can really look into uh, um, a combined strategy. So sometimes we don't publish them in the website, for instance, we just share them privately with donors, or uh, um, we don't even maybe share them, them with donor. We prepare a joint presentation and we just present the uh, we present the findings. Uh, but all in all, uh, what we suggest is that you don't refrain to do the protection analysis update because then we can really look together at the best strategy of using that. Other examples include sometimes we have been published as a protection cluster global and not as a country wise to avoid uh, repercussions at the level of the operation. So uh, the goal is that. Through the dialogue with the geographical focal point at the level of the GPC and us, we can really together and how to disseminate and better uh, and better use it. 
Um, well, the final step, of course, is the publishing, if we agree on the publishing. And one core aspect for everyone is that the automatic publishing, the publishing now goes through the Global Protection Cluster because we have been linking our website directly with Relief Web and with other platform. So by publishing in the Global Protection Cluster website, automatically gets published in all the platforms, uh, in all the humanitarian platforms, including Relief Web. So um, the last steps is basically to share the, do the final document with the regional focal point, and we normally publish it in, even within the day or within the hour. I mean, team, our colleague here is very, very efficient in that part. So resuming uh, uh, is not very it's not very scientific as a process, but we actually rationalize it a bit. So the, the change is that the engagement between the operation and the global protection cluster goes through the regional focal point. So you don't have to speak with multiple people in the global protection cluster. So that simplifies already the process. And then uh, we have a constant dialogue with the regional focal point. So Vincenza and the other colleague of the analysis team, uh, they are in support. Uh, the advocacy team is in support. So. Uh, on your side, from the level of the operation, you have one entry point, but then we will work as a team to actually trigger the, the support and the time. The advice is the more we anticipate, the better we can support. So uh, anticipating doesn't mean having one month in advance, but at least uh, if we have one, two weeks and we know that a professional update is coming, we can really, really, really support you. I mean, properly and, eff and efficiently. Um, again, the idea, and it's actually what we asked, the geographical focal point is to liaise with all operation to map out in uh, the PAUs for 2023. So that is also is going to support all of us uh, much better. Uh, what you're going to see uh, in the standard operating procedure is this graph, uh, and then also you're going to have a detailed uh, set of steps. We develop this mostly if you need to engage uh, at the level of operation, uh, you know, your constituency partner, the AUR, so you can really, we do try to develop a graph so you can show what are the core steps. Uh, and these core steps basically are resuming what we just discussed. So the first part is, uh, it basically clarifies that the decisions stay at the level of the cluster in country, uh, and the coordination goes through the regional focal point. Uh, as and you can see, the regional focal point is the one that liaises with the other colleagues in the global protection cluster side to provide support when it's needed, to provide briefing, mentoring, revisions, and everything that you might need. Um, and also, it clarifies a second part, which is uh, quite important, and uh, which uh, basically focuses on the fact that we're going to publish every analysis document. I mean, provided that it's good in quality and you want, and, and it's a document that is important for the operation. So the only things we're going to do is actually to identify what we actually are going to publish as a protection analysis update and what we are going to publish as something else. In those cases, we're going to engage together. We're going to, on our side, we will provide any advice you might need in framing the document. Um, but of course, again, the decision on what to publish, how, the dissemination strategy, and uh, if you strongly feel that the document should be a protection analysis update because you want the focus on risks, uh, we are going to have a dialogue together and uh, so we can really uh, be flexible and accommodate every single process that you have in mind. Um, when we go with the criteria, uh, and then uh, we, will, uh, we will finish the part of the process, uh, there are four core criteria for the publishing, which are this one, and also there are other core criteria that are more for quality, uh, which you will find in the standard operating procedure. The four criteria for the publishing are mostly quite easy. One is that we really advise, we have seen that a protection analysis update is stronger when the more it's participatory, not in the development, but at least you manage to engage all the constituency at the level of the cluster, being the partner, being the AUS, being other sector and other clusters. So really, we have seen that a protection analysis update sometimes we develop in office with not much consultation also doesn't have the buy-in. So if we want to be stronger in engaging uh, colleagues, uh, um, in engaging our targets, sorry, we really advise that and we use that criteria. That doesn't mean that nobody's going to chase to actually verify that you consult and so on. This is, a, this is just the responsibility of the cluster. I mean, it's just to, uh, that at the level of the cluster, you make sure that this, that this is done. Consistency, uh, we, every, is the, the limit of uh, five protection risks. Uh, so since it has to be an update and it's limited in pages, 
uh, if a document includes 10 or 9 or 8, uh, first of all, it's difficult to prioritize when you have too many, but in case there is a need for whatever reason, that will be another document. So we will call it something else. So we will use it as something else, uh, but to be a professionalized update, we will, we will look into that. Uh, then there are certain formats, uh, element, certain core elements in the format that should be maintained. So we just have a look. Of course, there is plenty of flexibility. I will give you a couple of examples now of a recent protection analysis update published for Afghanistan yesterday, where they had to adapt some parts. And of course, it has to be adapted because the goal is that it's relevant. Okay, so we, the only things we want to try to do is to, be, to have a bit of more of consistency across operations. So, uh, and the only element that is where we probably think that we, we would like to be more strict together is replacing what before was called the introduction. So before we had an introduction where we're just giving the account of the methodology of the approach and just some general situational inputs to an executive summary. This is fundamental often, specifically when we want to engage donor and we want to engage actors uh, for several reasons. Uh, the simplest is that oftentimes, specifically certain level of colleagues, uh, they just look at the beginning. So the executive summary is the place, the first page is, the, is where to put what we really want to say. Um, and second, it provides, it can really be easy, it be used as a one page of fact sheet that you can share and, and then and that can help us out in, uh, in for you for the dissemination of the protection analysis they per se. We will see the detail of it, but the goal is that here, um, I mean, currently, what 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 uh, you have in the document, uh, you provide very core elements on the, what happened in the context situation. Something very very important that actually is having a strong impact on protection. Um, they identify protection risk, of course, uh, and then two top line recommendations that, uh, as we will see later, can be either part of the recommendation that are at the end of the document or to core advocacy messages. So something really important that it has to be addressed in the period. I will make reference to the period all the time. So the goal is that instead of putting general recommendation or general aspect, we need to focus on recommendation or elements for the period. So you can really use them much more operationally. So uh, it has to be very linked with the dynamics in your country. As say the four criteria, the goal is that the, I mean, by the use, I think that they're going to become much, never, quite natural, but at least at the beginning, the regional focal points are there to support. So for everything you need, but also us, I mean, from the IM side, and Chins and colleagues can support, but also from our side, we can really support in help you out, in uh, envisaging how to actually go about the protection analysis update and adapt to specific situation. Uh, in, uh, in, in the rollout, one of the things that also we planned uh, is to have a, a, a third webinar. So the next webinar next week will be on protection risk. But then we plan another webinar around the end of April. And in that situation, what we would like to do with all of you is just get used to the to the guidance, get used to the formal, start the processes, and we will have a full entire webinar of feedbacks. Uh, so to get a sense from you, uh, if there are any specific situations that are complicated to use, or if we have to adapt some things, or we have to elaborate new guidance. So the idea is that we do a process piecemeal, uh, and we look actually we learn together from uh, from your use. Um, on the process, uh, that's all of it. Uh, um, now I would really like to, to stop and pause. So even if you don't have, uh, it would be great to, to hear if you have any questions or reflections, uh, but even if you have, I have a question for all of you. If you, how do you see it, you know, from your experience or if you have any experience, past experience on protection analysis update and you think that the guidance will help or not. So, Please don't be shy, and uh, if you can jump in, that would be great. And then I will pause a bit, and then we can go on the step by step. Maybe I start. I don't know if uh, let me thank also you, turn on my camera. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Francesco, for the um, the presentation. I think it. I was engaged when I was the classic coordinator in Iraq when we had a thematic power. That days was ah, yeah. uh, back in the, the days was one. the legal one. Uh, which was a very cumbersome process, but it was just the beginning mm -hmm. of all the POW process, right? So I think it, these uh, simplified guidelines uh, would make the process way easier. 
one um, and it's very it's very nice the fact that you put it visually right who is responsible etc so my um it's not a concern but i think it's something to be mindful of we will i mean i share this invite and i see some of the colleagues of the strategic advisory group in ukraine actually attending this session which is very very good because it's the point to make it a consultative process um and the uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know everybody needs to agree, but at least there is a common understanding. What I might find is that maybe we can we would need a bit more of your support in explaining again the process and getting that higher buy-in. It's because of some of the difficulties that we have in country here in Ukraine to navigate uh, different priorities among AORs. So I like the fact, and I would restress stress that again here that it is a uh, the definition of 15 protection risk has been discussed, agreed upon with the EORs, because that would certainly give us the leverage with the colleagues here. Um, also, because I mean, it's not to diminish the other operation, but here, you know, in Ukraine, everyone wants to showcase the why they have their own needs. And uh, what we, we miss oftentimes is this interconnectivity of a protection risk response and corresponding response, which is ultimately what we uh, want to showcase to donors and to key stakeholders. So um, maybe just to stress that point, and uh, you'll, you'll hear back from, from Ukraine operation very soon, and we might ask specific support from the GPC to make it very much, you know, bottom up, but in terms of the, we are all on the same page. Um, and maybe one to, I will follow up with Julian as the focal point for uh, for Ukraine, but I will certainly, we certainly have the plan to launch a POW consultation process very soon, but uh, then I'll uh, I'll share that information with, uh, with the relevant colleagues. Over, thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. I note it down and I will react quickly, but uh, I just leave space for other colleagues if you have any, maybe adding up to what Claudia just mentioned, because it might be a concern in other, in other countries, or if you have any other question or doubt or reflection. Well, let me react then and maybe this trigger a bit of, of discussion. No, thank you, Claudia. Uh, that's. Uh, we, one thing that we had clear when we were working on the guidance is that no guidance can simplify entirely a process for the country because the situation in an operation entails a lot of things, entails uh, politics, um, balances of roles, uh, responsibilities, uh, priorities, and the situation is so fluid, then it, uh, it might have to change. So. Um, that's absolutely taken. Without without mentioning the country, we have been doing that in uh, in the testing of this guidance with a couple of operations where we had actually dedicated session between uh, us, cluster, and the AUR coordinators to actually go and having a really open brainstorming of what all are the priority on the table and try to guide in a way of prioritizing. So one, our message is that prioritizing doesn't mean diminishing one against the other. That's the core message. So prioritizing means just be stronger in the way we present, uh, which sometimes is the weakness uh, we have because we really want to present everything and protection is quite a particular sector for that. And uh, and by presenting, sometimes when, by presenting everything, we diminish what we want to present. So uh, that narrative, honestly, in other contexts where we had sensitive situation, it worked well because, um, and the fact, that's the reason also that we work very, very strict, very, very, closely with the AUR to define it, to, to have the definitions. And of course, there were discussion on uh, the, the 15 risks, they don't reflect specifically the AUR, they don't have specific area of the AUR, but the goal was, yeah, because one risk for us is not important, even if it's not a risk that is a specific area of work of an AUR, it's extremely important to have their perspective and their analysis and to, uh, to understand the multiple factors, both in terms of driver and impact. And is that what we try to shape? You will see the definition, even if some of them are specific, gender-based violence is gender-based violence. But if, for instance, even gender-based violence, there is another risk, which is denial of resource opportunity, which is a core violation also of gender-based violence. And there, there is a specific linkage to involve GBD colleagues. And also when it comes to child protection, we didn't just focus on the three that are more child-focused risks, but also we look at attacks, you will find other elements on now, 
child protection concern and consideration might have to be linked to other risks. So absolutely happy to support. Uh, I think that maybe one good thing would be look at the definition and try to understand and a bit the guidance and then happy to line up any support. But uh, yeah. we know that that also will be an exercise uh, to do together. It's not uh, something that we expect tomorrow to have all the perfect protection risk defined, but it is it's a good exercise. So that uh, will be my reaction, probably. So I'm happy to follow up, and uh, I don't know if you have a reaction, but uh, that's one particular area that what we try to do with the guidance to address. Yeah. No, I mean I think it's it's perfect. It's just this way of uh, really trying to make sure that it's a multi-sectoriality of protection, right? Uh, because it is uh, it's not one, uh, as you said, one child protection or GBV of mine action affecting. Uh, mm -hmm only one thing but it's really much interconnected in protection mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. i think that it's uh, we'll certainly follow up requesting support if needed to from your side and colleagues side uh, to have that this particular discussion with the aors here in country uh, should we should we need so yeah perfect yeah, yeah. The other element, which is something that in the medium long term we, we, we will have to all together to, to, to see how to do it better, is the engagement of other sectors. Because there are sometimes we want really our protection risk to showcase the linkages with other sectors where we can be stronger. If we manage to provide recommendations that actually can engage, I don't know, food security, health, or education or other sector in the moment. So, and that and we so far we didn't develop a specific guidance on how to do the consultative process because that really depends on the country. So that's also something we can look at together. Uh, but uh, in the definition is we we I mean we really focus on the internal consistency, but is they are already pointing to the need of engaging certain sector for specific risks um, because uh, so we can really start providing a wider account on the all the interlinkages. Thank you, Claudia. There is any other doubt question? Or reflection? Any other colleagues from any other operation that? Uh, no. Because with next session, we are going to really go into chapter by chapter. So there's a reason that I want to just get opposed not to basically give you too much information at the same time. Um, otherwise, I can start and then maybe what I can do since we're going to go chapter by chapter, I can present the chapter, stop, and then your reflection and go, and go on. Um, if it's OK, if there is any, maybe give me a thumbs up if you think that we can continue or if we have to go even back to certain aspects. Amazing, thank you. OK, so on the step by step part, um, what I thought it might be interesting is actually to discuss with you the rationale behind the chapter, because it might not be perfect, but at least to, to discuss really openly with all of you what was our rationale in actually shaping it so we can really have your direct feedbacks. So let's start from the executive summary. So the executive summary um, is one page, and this will be very strict. We cannot be one page and two lines, one page, three lines, one page. This is extremely important for the dissemination side of it, for the advocacy side of it, and so on. And also that, uh, linking also what we were discussing with Claudia, really help us out in focusing and maybe give you also an elements to, with your constituency to say, okay, we really have to focus on two things we want to say. So that's a bit the goal. The first part of the executive summary um, is providing main context update. So the idea is not to re sorry for that is not to represent all the context analysis, but is actually to visualize the one two core changes situation that recently happened that you really 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 want to showcase to let uh, you know donors partner colleagues uh, humanitarian coordinator understand the, the, the impact of risks. Here an example, that is the one you're going to find in the sample. And um, as you can see from the example, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but uh, the first paragraph is more situational. So in this Republic of Sorami, that it's a fake country that we develop, there is brink of famine, there is severe drought, conflict, climate shock. So it's something that it's sort of basically multiple compounded drivers. But then uh, if you can see, and if what we actually um, suggest, is that try to be specific on certain regions. Sometimes we focus too much at country level, while we are realizing now our exchanges with donor and colleagues that they would like to see 
not the, the overall situation. They might know the overall situation, but they would like to have from us protection cluster as zoom in specific region. So here the example is see what are the since January 2022 recent conflicts in these five regions and other area, a couple with flooding in this other area uh, and this impact. So it's an example, but uh, uh, that's where the situational update should be focused, should be if you don't have a general situational update, you can use a zoom in in specific regions. This should help in then providing here just the list of the five to five risks because the risk identified as priority. Just the list because then the situational update can be very much linked with the risks. So it can clear to a reader that the, to a, uh, what is actually exacerbating why, and also it can give you an account of why you prioritize that. So you might have a six risk that is very strong and very continuous. And maybe here you can see that there is no, for instance, gender-based violence. I mean, not any specific one on conflict-related gender, but another one, maybe there is a conflict, there is um, an accompanied children, there's a high rate of accompanied children. Here is not a between the priority, but maybe it's an important aspect, but then this will be found in the analysis linked to other risks because maybe it's related to attacks. So it's not the fact that it's not priority, it's not going to be there. The third element here is where we suggest to flag uh, core urgent recommendation, core urgent action. That's the reason we call it urgent action needed. So here you can build either in the recommendation section or what you have in the recommendation. Um, or uh, again, uh, you can develop the protection analysis update, think of two core strong advocacy message and to include the strong advocacy message here. Uh, what we suggest, and we will actually delve into that later, is to always put a timeline. That's extremely fundamental. Sometimes when we ask for recommend, when we ask for something and we put a recommendation, we just put it general. What we suggest is this is the protection analysis update, let's say, of March. It covers between January and March. If this is not done by April, we will expect this. If this is not done, done by the summer, we will expect this. So it doesn't mean being specific. But it, it helps in actually be much stronger in advocating. Um, and again, it can be either the same recommendation for, from the recommendation part, or it can be um, a call to action or specific advocacy message. Again, looking at the one of the example you're going to find in the sample. Uh, here we in the in the sample we we actually the, in the context we saw that there has been a law approved that uh, actually is banning organization to work for instance. Um, so here we say that as, if we, there is no specific uh, uh, work to actually amend or to react to this law, then it's going to be impossible for us to provide certain uh, certain certain response to specific areas. It's just one example, but just to tell you how it links with the context. Um, then uh, there are two elements uh, that are related to the severity, which uh, we try to be a bit more rational, also the learning from experience. Sometimes uh, we had the protection analysis update published in November with the severity map that you use for the HL and HRP of the December of the previous year. Okay, so there has been 11 months in between. In 11 months, a lot of change happens. So here, what we suggest is always trying to include a severity map, but either to have it the most updated. So if you develop one for the HNO, and then you are doing a protection analysis update in June, re-update the severity map because that will really help in you know, maintaining constant dialogue. And also then it will anticipate the work for the next HNO. So the idea is also that instead of waiting the end of the year, it simplify our work. So some of the work you can do for the protection analysis update can actually simplify the work for the HNO. But even if you don't have that and you want to include the, old, the oldest severity map, so even if it's been passing one month, we included uh, another suggestion, which is putting a table at the end of the executive summary where you could even between the discussion within the SAG or expert judgment and so on, provide an outlook of where the severity change in the different provinces and region compared to the latest one. Okay, so the idea is that we provide, we show, so that has been the severity map, the severity that we identified several months ago. In this update, we have been noticing that, for instance, like in the example, in Manura, in Solbay, and in Raimi, in these three regions, there has been an increase. So they moved 
from severity four to severity five, and at least to provide a visual account. So again, we know that this exercise really, really depends on IM capacity on how you organize your work. So this table is there as a suggestion, and we can try to start working together. So the goal of the executive summary, it both provides the update, but it links up with all the work you do on, uh, on severity HNO you know, and everything in one go. So this is what happened, and we think it's important that uh, the reader uh, pay attention to, you know, uh, even in specific areas. These are the risks we identified, and this is how the situation is changing in terms of severity. And these are the, th the, 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 two, the two asks, the two urgent actions that we really think as a protection sector, they should be addressed. So we think that it's quite simple in the testing more or less work. We realize that sometimes uh, you might have need of introducing some different graphs or or, or, uh, or inputs in the executive summary, and that's totally fine. I give you an example, as I was saying before, on Afghanistan. They recently published yesterday the new protection analysis update. In Afghanistan, there is a ban in January to female worker work in, uh, in NGOs uh, nationwide. So the colleagues in Afghanistan decided to focus the protection analysis update on the impact of the ban. So priority risk related to the situation that the ban has been creating. So here they just replaced uh, this initial severity more with uh, an initial stage of how the operation are actually constrained. So some graphs, some information. So total flexibility, but the core aspect, the situational update, the highlight of risk and the recommendation, we always suggest to maintain them and we can really work together in making sure that uh, it actually makes sense for you. Let me pause here on the executive summary. Uh, I will have two questions. One is, do you see it complicated? There is anything of it that you see it's impossible to do in your operation and uh, or if you have any specific reflection and then we can move to, to the next chapter is all clear sometimes up in case you don't want to intervene thank you claudia So even feel free to pause me. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Please come in. Yeah, hey, hey everyone, Stuart. Sorry about that. I was trying to react with a thumbs up and not raise my hand. <laughs> but if you want to have a reflection now that you are here, you're in the room. No, it's, uh, it's, it's all very clear. Thank you. Thank you, though. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> It's early. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No, thank you for coming. I'm trying to be slow. You know, Italians can speak very fast. I'm trying to be slow, and I hope I'm not overwhelming you. <laughs> OK, so let's go to the context. So the first aspect about the context is really to be simple, be focused, I would say. So oftentimes, we tend to actually provide this long analysis of the context. Stuart, I'm going to ask you questions. <laughs> um, to be, we have this longer, longer, long, long section on the context that honestly, in many operations, maybe we repeat things that are known. Um, so we really try to, first of all, limit to three pages, as you can see. So that can really help you out in focus. And then the message is that there is no need of providing the overall story of the context, but really what is really, really, really important to to showcase, to understand protection risk analysis. So that can also help in reducing the protection risk part. We can introduce some elements there, and then it can, it can help in reducing the second part. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> um, so that's the first point. Uh, since for the one of you that uh, are aware of the protection analysis framework and you are actually applying the protection analysis framework, the protection analysis framework actually guides in a very good analysis of the context. So if you manage to do that in your operation, it's good to use that for this operation. Otherwise, for this, it's good that you combine, combine both quantitative and qualitative. But my suggestion or our suggestion is that you really engage your local areas. You know, sometimes we really rely only on data, and while the context updates specific at the subregion can come with the knowledge we have and our colleagues in the local areas they have. You know, we have had uh, this conversation in one of the operations where we really had uh, 
three, four strong field offices. We didn't have data because the situation was very, very complex, but we had a lot of qualitative good information what was happening. So you can really shape on that. Don't be afraid of using. That's where also the, maybe this can also help you out in the engagement, in making sure that you have the buy-in and the engagement of the constituencies. So uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the, the only core element that should be maintained is that at the beginning of the context session, we introduce a table to provide five core figures. It might be by four, but five maximum. So the idea of the five core figures is might also not come all of, from the protection sector. There might be also core figures from something else that is important, is relevant to understand the risks. So here in the example, these are all the examples you're going to find the sample. Here we put the number of IDPs uh, related to droughts or the IDPs related to conflict. So these two elements are fundamental because in the in this scenario that we develop in the sample, those are strong drivers or, and they compound uh, uh, the impact of the risks. One of the things that we suggest, because all is, is we realize that is where maybe donor expect or the donor, they ask us not just to provide general numbers, but tell us what is the update. So what we suggest, probably the first protection analysis update is not possible, but then when you start regularly developing them, it try to give a bit more and more or less a sense of the variations. So we suggest to include the variation compared to the latest protection analysis update. So three months ago, six months ago, this what was happening. Now this is the, the, the variation, but also the variation compared to the same period of the previous year. So that really can already these numbers give a really a sense of the urgency of certain situation. So if you look at example, for instance, in GBV, the total numbers if somebody doesn't know the context, doesn't tell much because the total number can be relative compared to the last 15 years, can be high, can be low, but providing the percentage tells something. So compared to the latest PAU, we have found an increase of 20%. But compared to the same period of last year, there's been basically an increase of 50%. So those are important aspects because then you can build also your narrative in the context afterwards with these numbers. So this really gives a sample. And also maybe this, uh, is an area where you can also focus different PAUs in different moments uh, with different data. One of the things we suggest, and this is not coming from us, this is actually good practice that some operation had in the last year and a half, uh, is that instead of using, we advise to use the protection analytical framework context analysis to guide your context analysis, but in shaping it in the PAU, instead of using this, the, the title of the chapter of the protection and framework, try to use, if you want to introduce subheadings, to introduce subheading that already tells something. So we found that it's extremely interesting when the subheading already visualize a problem or a trend or something, uh, because that can catch the attention, uh, even if someone is not gonna read the whole doc, the whole analysis. So um, to show you a couple of examples that you will find again in the sample, for, in the scenario we develop, Steady erosion of livelihood and copy capacity, that's already tells something. So in this period, one important aspect is that compared to the last, there has been, we have been identified uh, an erosion of livelihood. So as you can see, this might be also from another sector. That's one of the problematic that is or some one of the driver or some an element that it's actually compounding all the risk we identified. And then uh, the second is a bit general, but also it, 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 it invites an understanding of what's happening worrying impacts of poor governance and the disruption of community fabrics. So maybe everybody knows that it's a conflict. Everybody knows that it's an intercommunal fight in, the, in, the, in your context or in the context. But here, what we are highlighting in the context that for us, what is fundamental to understand is the disruption of community fabrics. That is what is having the major impact on the protection risk we identified. So again, in the context session, wide flexibility. So it can be shaped any way or form beside the first table. And the only suggestion is to use the subheading smartly in order to convey messages. For the visual, the graphs, the data, and everything you want to include, uh, we, we will try to work this year in helping you out with standards, but the idea is that read that really is contextual. You, you all have different set of monitoring or set of data, so really use what you have. The only suggestion we provide is that in the protection analysis update, we don't want to provide a report. We want to provide an update. So if you have protection monitoring, multi-sector assessment, where you have single questions, 
try not to include uh, the just the single question answer. So a graph that tells us how many women, how many men, how many children, how many specific groups uh, answer to a question. So that's the only thing that we advise not to do because that is good for a report, but in the analysis, it should be something that combines. So if you have to report some data, try always to combine two, two, two questions or something, uh, but not report on single on single data points, as we as we say. And then try to include even graphs, maps uh, that overlay or relay different factors to show some trends. You know, oftentimes it's better to show even a trend, even if you don't have a very strong monitoring mechanism, then uh, uh, just one single data. That is much more relevant. And then you can build your know, narrative, you know, on that. Um, and that's it. That's for the context. Again, uh, let me pause one moment if there is any doubt on the context part. Any question? Please, uh, Makan, sorry if I mispronounced. No, no, this is good. Okay, uh, thank thank you for for this. Maybe I just uh, miss uh, uh, one part that I think is very important for uh, for us as uh, information uh, managers. So uh, it is about uh, the uh, variation uh, last PU and the uh, versus uh, last year. And uh, if you look at the the figures here, the numbers, then uh, what? percentage period and year period stand for just to clarify i just um, I, I missed this part ah sorry <laughs> yeah okay, i can clarify so the percentage period is the variation compared to the latest protection noise update so let's say that you're going to produce a protection noise update now so it's march and then one in october so in October, you show in March we present this, but it, in now we're presenting this. So it's the variation of the two periods. So the, the value in March and the value in October. The, the percentage with the year is compared to the same period of the year before. So you're going to produce a protectionized update in that now, in March 2023, and it's the comparison with uh, uh, March 2022. Um, thank you. My pleasure. And then, of course, uh, um, there is one. Uh, thank you, Vincenzo, for the protection, uh, the people in need. Uh, um, for the people in need numbers, uh, there are two areas. You will see it. Uh, we didn't delve into that, but in the executive summary, there is uh, uh, a table to provide the updates on the, um, the people in need numbers. But also in the context session, what we advise is that if it's relevant to the context analysis to put the, your data on the protection of the, the people in need, please include it. Uh, but what is would be important, the farthest you go from the latest HNO, if you manage to have an update. So the goal is always to try to have a focus on the update part. Okay. So and that's the overall message for the all for your guidance. Use what you have as much as you can. So of course, severity and people in need, uh, but the, the more you move in time from the latest calculation you did, try to provide updates. So even if you put the, the, the number, the latest number you have, try to qualify what happened. Sometimes you don't mind have the new calculation, but try to provide a narrative. You know, this was the number we had in the latest period, this and this happened, so we expect to, be, to have an increase or something like that. So the goal is, even in the context, and as you will see in the protection section, to be to actually provide an, an analytical update. Okay. Protection risks. Uh, ah, yes, McCann, please. So, so wh what you uh, you were saying here, just to clarify, is uh, like uh, you you uh, we have to if we 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 uh, develop produce then uh, like we produce the uh, severity map update the severity map then we have to estimate. Uh, how many people could be in need at, th at that period, right? Yeah, it should be able to have an update for the period. The exact details, uh, what I suggest you, Makan, I mean, the Vincenzo and the colleague of the IAM will support you on all that area, you know, how to input to that. But the goal, yeah, it should be that. If you manage to update severity in the PIN for the time of the protection of SLA, that's the most advisable part. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Protection risks, uh, um, again, limitation in pages, same goal 
that we have basically been repeating during the whole webinar is just to be focused, to actually give you also another elements that the reason that you need to, to have a more well, not consensus, but at least to rationalize things. Um, so here, bear with me because uh, this we are going to have a specific section on protection risk next Wednesday, but here I will start actually guiding you on some elements. Um, so first of all, what are the five protection risks in the period? That's fundamental. So not the overall risks that are priority in the country, but what we have identified that is important to focus on our attention in the last period. So all in the period that covers the, the PAU. Um, here, I mean, I'm building again on what Claudia was saying before, ensure the engagement of uh, partners say you are, because we, what we want to be better to show is the correlation of the different areas in corresponding to one risk. Because that we really may, it makes our impact stronger. We can show our joint programming, our overall programming, or our joint action, how all of them are contributing to actually address a situation. And that's something that I think is important for us, but also is extremely interesting to donor, to the HC, to the partner, because we can show really a, a, new, a, new, uh, a unique approach or an integrated approach to, to the situations. And then when we were developing the definition, we, I think we're quite aware that you sometimes you can't use the exact wording or definition in a context. There are sensitivities, there is specific language that is used in the context. So uh, even if we have core definition, we want you to be sure that you have full space to actually do an adaptation. Okay, so the goal of the core definition, and we will see the process how to do it next week, is not that you take them and you copy paste them. I mean, if they are okay and they're relevant, you can do that, for, of course. But you can really reflect with your with the partners, the SAG and the EOS on how that core definition translates in the country. The only the only elements that we provide is minimum elements when you are going to write a protection risks because protection risks are a form of violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation. So to be a protection risk, there are certain elements in the language that has to be maintained. So a very simple hint, but you will find also in the guidance. The first one is avoid general formulations because those, they, they don't give us the focus. So one that I found often is all forms of violence. Avoid that. I mean, Probably there are all forms of violence in the country, but that also doesn't help in, in, in showing where we want a priority. So really try to define specifically what type of violence you want to prioritize, but then in the description, you can, you can because they are all interrelated. So try really to, to be more specific. Or house, housing, land and property as a general risk, please don't include it because it doesn't tell us what is the risk. If it's a problem with impediments with illegal identity or it's uh, access to justice, so all is addiction. So focus on one that is core, and of course in the analysis, then you link with other with other forms of or other elements. The second hint I'll call it is in order to be a, a protection risk, always try to include something that relates to the form of violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation. So it's a man-made factors. So uh, wording like force, denial, impediments, or of course attack. Uh, Recruitment is in this relates to to man-made to human factors. So try always in the definition to include something about that. And then the third hint is that we might some of you maybe are in a situation where the core problematic, the core humanitarian problematic, is on, on another sector: food security, malnutrition, uh, the impact of climate change. So. There are situations that goes beyond protection. And, and what we found that mostly in those situations, sometimes protection get deprioritized because of course there is an urgent need to respond to something else. So our suggestion both to build our narrative, but also to show the, the protection perspective on things is not to use the same sector title or problematic as a risk. So not, not like food security, but try to, to, to to, to focus on the risk or on the risks that are either the driver of that problematic or an effect. So always maintain a linkages, of course, with the situation, but really focus on protection. The latest is the very general. Uh, again, it's like the, the first one. Let's not put conflict as a protection risk or uh, ongoing violence or occupation. I know that might seem silly and simple for you, but we wanted to actually put some more, some simple elements that can guide all of us. 
uh, in, uh, in actually be more consistent in driving protection risk. So even in those cases, ongoing violence, what is the, of that ongoing violence that is the risk? Is the attacks or the fact that there is a high rate of abduction, what it is? And then, of course, the part of general part it can be in the context. So the risk then again in terms of shaping the balance, included visual elements and everything, full flexibility. So this really can be discussed at the level of your constituency with the data that you have and with the same messages of before. Try to do correlation, try not to use single data points. Uh, if you have questionnaire or an assessment that you recently done, try to put two, three more, two, three questions together. So again, the same analysis is stronger. Um, that's it on the risk. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna enter into that next week. Uh, but let me pause again a moment if there is any question on this section. Some thumbs up in case. Thank you. The response section. Um, here I would like to you to pay a bit more of attention because we change a bit the response section and is where probably we try to put um, a more thought. thought. The, normally what we've been doing all the last year and a half, which is absolutely fine, is to use what you already do in the country. You have you beautiful exercises and dashboard that actually show uh, funding data, programming data, partner scope and everything. What we realized is that it's good that you keep that as a separate type of analysis document that you can use and you use the protection analysis update to reinforce that data. So you're going to present to donors your funding, uh, your funding data, your programming data and so on, and that's fine. But use the protection analysis update actually to, to put, point the attention to specific elements. So those specific elements are, and it's been, it's been more or less on a logic. First of all, start with the progress made. So start with the positive. Oftentimes, and that's been one of the comments of a couple of donors that we engage, is that we always present the negative. You know, we cannot do this, we cannot do that, and so on. But we are going to present that, you're going to see it. But start, let's start with the progress made. We have, and I can show you one quick example. So it might not be positive, but it can be a progress. We try to do this, we try to inform that. So here, uh, for instance, in the second paragraph, you will see in the first is about the partners and the people reached and so on. The second paragraph is in this uh, scenario, we finally managed to have our first uh, humanitarian explosive ordnance intervention in an area controlled by the rebels. L let's put it uh, it's fundamental, it's progress, it's something that we try to do and also showcase the efforts that we are doing as a set. And then you might have several. I mean, one, what we try to thought is if you manage to focus on the people reached, them, there's a good number because then it can be compared to the pin. This is the pin that we had, and this is the, the people we reached. The second is the access for protection. So we, we show the progress, but then we, we, we say these are the constraints that we, find, we are finding. So these are all the constraints we're finding. So we we'll call it access to protection because, as you know, we launched a global campaign on access to protection. So the idea is also to start having the protection analysis update be linked to that so they can be mutually reinforcing and we can use also in our advocacy for the campaign. Uh, but for you, what is important is consider trends and variation, key events or situation, but also, again, try to show some efforts. We found this constraint, we found this modality, we found this alternative, but these are the constraints we are facing. Here is one example where we are saying that basically, again, it can be related to specific regions or to specific areas. So with safety and security is actually curbing our capacity in these and these other regions. And to conclude then is when you present the critical gaps. So we managed to do this. These are the constraints and these are the gaps that these constraints are causing or the gaps that we are having. They can be of many kinds. It can be funding, it can be operation, it can be access. And always try to link it with the risks that you try to identify before. So here again, uh, in related to before, uh, in, uh, in another area, so one of progress is when we managed to enter with explosive oral intervention in this area. But then uh, uh, the, the critical gaps is that another area, we actually, uh, the partner that was working, stopped the funding and now we have a gap, okay? And this is causing this and this and this. Our suggestion is to be very, very focused on the, on the regions if you cannot. 
Uh, I will move to recommendation because I see that the time is almost coming to an end, but please raise your hand uh, if you have any doubt or question even on the response section. The recommendations, uh, uh, of course, key recommendations, uh, that's uh, that's at you, is limited to two pages, so we also focus on key recommendations. We don't have this huge list uh, because one of the goal and one of the suggestions is that we will, we will have to try to start using that, those recommendations as a roadmap. Also to be able to report what happened or also to actually try to have some accountability to the actors that we asked those recommendations to. Um, you will see that the structure is quite, this is quite fixed, uh, organize the recommendation by risk for the same logic. This is the, our analysis, this is the priority, and this is our collective uh, way forward that we see. Uh, you can consider many aspects. You can consider when it will the protection risk worsen by time if something is not done. Uh, will the modality we are using now have a negative impact or a negative exacerbation of the risk we identified? Is there a recent trend that we identify in this protection analysis update that requires specific attention? So there are many ways of going about it, uh, but try to focus on the risks. The second element that we introduce, again, this is from uh, best practice, uh, but for us it's very, very helpful in using the protection analysis update, is for each risk, really focus the recommendation to a target. Okay. And for that, what we try to do, we develop four general categories of targets that you can use, uh, that are those one that you see in the example. You can adapt the wording. So, for instance, you look at the first group, government authorities, the fact authorities and parties to the conflict. If you want to specify government of or uh, ministry of, because it's part of one, of course you can do it. These are ge general categories. So even when you have donors, member states, uh, if you really want to qualify it and contextualize, you can. Our only suggestion is that you maintain separate the four core groups because this really helps help us out in building a collective advocacy. So on the level of the, one of the efforts that we're doing on the advocacy side of the global protection cluster is actually to identify all recommendations that we do to governments, to humanitarian coordinators, because for instance, if we manage to have all uh, recommendations that we do to humanitarian coordinators, then we can build a collective advocacy to another higher level. This is everything that we've been trying to discuss with humanitarian coordinator in countries. That's the only caveat, Otherwise, it's fully flexible to adapt the wording and so on. And, and seeing it in another way, basically the goal is that for each recommendation, you try to have always certain elements. The target, which is discussed, the linkage with the protection risk, but then try to not put a general situation. Uh, we have to address uh, um, gender-based violence in the country, but try to include an action, uh, something that suggests what to do. <clears throat> A timeline, same discussion for the executive summary, even if it's not a, a detailed timeline by the third quarter, by the second quarter in 2023, some, a loose timeline is good. So these recommendations should be enacted by, in order to, and that's made the recommendation much stronger uh, compared to a general one. If you have a general recommendation for the country to make it stronger, sometimes use locations. So we really have to prevent forced eviction specifically in this region, in this region, in this region, because maybe those are the three regions that in the protection analysis update, the situation got worse. So we know that there's a problem of eviction at the country level, but in the recommendation, since it's related to the period of the PAU, try to link it, link it up with that. And of course, we always try to balance recommendations that are beyond the protection sector with recommendation for us, because that also gives a bit of accountability. We show that we are not just telling others, but also we are actually looking out to adjust our approach. And with this, uh, on the recommendation I finished, this is an example. I will just look at the first one, where you can see the linkage with the risk, the denial of access to services, the target, advocate with the Ministry of Education to allow children who are missing some valid identity and civil documents to enroll in school and participate in public exams. That's the action before September 2022. This recommendation, of course, you, we will have in the analysis something that says that if that doesn't happen, there will be certain consequences. So this is just one example, and will, we are going to find it in the in the in the sample. That's it uh, on the step by step. Sorry that uh, maybe it was too much. We have uh, five minutes to the time, so 
I think I will skip this part uh, unless it's important to just open if there is any question, doubt, or if reflection. Let me ask some of you, how do you see, what is the most challenging parts of a protection analysis update, and how do you see that maybe some of these new guidance can help you out? Maybe if someone wants to have a quick reaction. Maybe I'll go I, again. Yeah, please, <laughs> but very quickly, very quickly, I think it's, uh, I mean, it, it will help in the sense that it's way more structure and way more supported in the in the thinking process right as you said the simple recommendation which i see that's from uh the report in iraq <laughs> where the recommendation yeah. was very generic and now if i had if we had had that type of support earlier right considering also mm. the, the different um challenges um would have made perhaps a bigger impact uh, and mm. better way of phrasing something that might be known to everybody but it needs to be phrased in a better way Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you. No, it's good to hear that. And also one thing that we realize is sometimes uh, to give a better support from the global protection cluster side, uh, the more we try to target the recommendation, the better we know who to engage. You know, sometimes we have moments that maybe we don't structure, but maybe some of our protection cluster coordinators might have a meeting with, uh, I don't know, with CEDA or with a specific donor or with a specific actor in the next three weeks uh, for something else. If we know in your recommendation that something is related to that particular actor, we can flag it automatically. So that I think, uh, I mean, it's what we try to do, try to actually make a better use of everything. So thank you, Claudia. Anyone else? I know it's early in the morning for many and uh, maybe I've been too quick. I hope it was clear. Uh, the idea was to actually have a run through. Um, we are gonna, this has been recorded, so we're gonna share it again. So if you needed to share it with partners or uh, with uh, other colleagues in the country, uh, that's, that's the goal. We're gonna have a second session uh, this afternoon. And of course, we're gonna have a follow up. Um, so the idea was not to actually present and expect that you are able, but the idea is to have another the next month and a half, try to plan your PAUs, and then we are going to have the, the next uh, this, this session of feedback and reflection why you're going to start using it. So from the practice, we can actually discuss better together. Um, also, if there is apologies for having done the, the session just in English. Uh, I mean, for the participants, we had to, to choose, uh, but we are very much happy as well to do specific session in, uh, in either in French or in Spanish. Again, reach out to the geographical focal point. This has been discussed, so we can actually organize. So uh, the message is basically use this as an opportunity to reach out if you see any need. OK, we try to develop the guidance, but the idea is not that we leave you alone. So please reach out and we will try to find the best way of supporting you. Uh, we have Vincenza and the colleagues of the information and analysis team that are very good and very, very helpful on everything. On our side, on the advocacy, we can help you. And if I can help you in understanding better the guidance and so on and so forth, I'm here for, for everything. I will, I will put my email in the chat, uh, so it's OK. And if there are no further questions, uh, we are three minutes to the time. Um, Vincenza, please. I will. Uh, hi, everyone. I will uh, switch off, uh, switch on the camera just to uh, again uh, um, recon uh, Francesco and say, "Me, I'm Vincenza, and uh, happy and glad to support you in case of uh, um, a supervi supervision of an elaboration of the PAO. So we are here, and just just this is uh, just a quick message, and thank you for uh, for reaching us." Of course, the first is the, the regional focal point, and then we are <laughs> the institution uh, itself. Thank you, Vincenza. As you can see, we are all excited to support you, and we will try to do our best all the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. So if there is no further question, reflection, or reaction, uh, I included my email in the chat. Um, and uh, I think we, we can close the session. And uh, I thank can you very wish much. My pleasure, and I can wish everybody a good uh, week, uh, weekend, and uh, and everything else. Thanks, Francesco. Thank you.
Bye bye. Great pleasure. Thank you for your timing. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Je passe tous les affaires qui ont définitivement.